So welcome. So now we're going to cover quite a bit in a very short time. So I'll apologize as we get started, because if this seems like a bit of a rush, um, it's somewhat intentional and in that I'm going to try to introduce a variety of topics um, as we explore what really is uh, the process of going from seeking uh, a subject for your painting to actually working through and laying out the painting. So I'm gonna be talking about a couple of things specifically, some really quick look at how you set up a composition. What are those things that help to determine um, not only the composition, but the illusion of pictorial space? Uh, Cause we're, I'm gonna make the assumption uh, that, and what I'm demonstrating is a traditional approach to the observed world. So some degree of realism, whether that be highly realistic, realistic, or semi-abstracted. Um, so much of what I'm talking about is making the assumption um, that we are dealing with uh, a direct observation kind of recording of realism. So uh, I'm gonna go through a variety of things. We're gonna pause and I'm gonna then actually go and work on a painting for part of today's demonstration. And if there's time, I'm gonna talk even more about painting and I'm gonna make sure we leave a little bit of time at the end for some questions. So here we go. I'm gonna share a screen if you already haven't been in a Zoom class uh, in these last uh, 14 months, then hoo -hoo, welcome to one. So I'm gonna share a screen and we're gonna be looking at some images. Okay, so when we're talking about painting, one of the first things, actually any design, there's a couple of things just to keep in mind. If you want the illusion of deep pictorial space. So I happen to love landscape and much of what I spend my time on is landscape. So as I'm going out seeking subject, um, whether I'm seeking to locate the composition intact from my direct observation, or whether I'm looking to take a whole lot of imagery from my observation and sort of recompose as I need to create a composition. Here's some basic, uh, these six basic rules or topics will always, always create observation based on the way we perceive, the way our human eye is, um, the physiology of our eye and our perception. So any overlap, no matter what's happening on the, within the composition of what you're designing, the more overlap that is present, the more your brain reads there is space necessary for those objects to occupy space. Anytime you have light and shadow, and anybody who's ever seen interviews with filmmakers or cinematographers, or if you've ever taken a video class, light and shadow is why we understand something is um, occupying space and having volume and form. So the moment light and shadow is present, your brain reads that is meaning that shape is physically occupying space, even though of course we know it's the illusion on um, 2D space. Placement or scale, um, objects that are towards the bottom of the page will tend to, we will read those as closer to us, objects that are towards the middle or back of the page, of the composition I should say, um, we will see as receding or being farther away. And that has a direct correlation. So often when I'm teaching, I put three and four in this particular example together, and that is scale. If something is, if you put a large circle and a small circle on a pure white piece of paper, somebody will tell you that the large one is closer to you. Scale indicates our brain reads anything that's larger as moving forward, anything that's smaller as receding and going backwards. And then this notion of and again, I'm using a different artist because it was easier to find slides or find images off the web than use my um, little sketchbook images I often use when I'm teaching. So number five is talking about value and focus. I often just, just talk about blur. The sharper something is, the sharper the contrast, the sharper the value, the sharper the edge, the closer something moves. The more there is blur in terms of edge or less contrast in terms of light and shadow uh, and value, then the more it moves back. And then the sixth is actually a theoretical uh, technique that was designed simply to exploit the illusion of pictorial space, and that is linear perspective. So many of you probably, even if you don't remember, you probably did one point perspective somewhere way back when you were in, it typically is somewhere between fifth and seventh grade that you do 
a one point perspective project if you took an art class. Um, some of you may have explored and studied two point and three point and yes there is a four and a five point perspective as well which become even more theoretical. But any of those six things always describe pictorial illusion. Generally in any image we're looking at you'll have five or six of them present. So when you're aware of them, it simply, it simply makes the control and the manipulation of them more of a tool instead of an accident. So let me go to that next image. The other thing most of you have probably heard of is this thing called the rule of thirds. And the rule of thirds is pretty simple. Let me just grab a pen that'll show up. So as you see, the rule of thirds where you take any image so let's say you're doing a bunch of sketches in your sketchbook and you're trying to figure out which one works better. So if you just sort of randomly split that page in three, your goal is you're trying to find, these are the sweet spots. You're trying to find that the focus or the interest within your composition, um, and I could make that even bigger, sort of resides in those regions near those intersections. So when you look at this one, Boom, everything's right there in the middle. You've got a bullseye. And that's absolutely something you sort of want to avoid. So let me clear this and get rid of it. And look at the same scene, slightly rearranged. In this case, you can see, if we apply that rule of thirds, you've got something that has distinct interest occurring here. You're giving us a leading line, which helps to take our eye through the composition happening there. You've got this sort of deep space that is being described, the background described there. So this is a nice example how all of this works. And the one thing I didn't put up, and I guess I should have, is on top of pictorial space and the rule of thirds, you also want to think about foreground, middle ground, background. And I'll come back to that when we look at some images. So you always are sort of trying to manipulate foreground, those objects which are closest, larger in scale, often cropped to the side, middle ground, usually where you're focusing your attention, and then background, that which describes um, the illusion of depth that recedes the farthest in whatever the particular subject that you're dealing with. And this is another, um, is if anybody's ever taken a digital, digital design course, uh, in a lot of the digital manipulations in studio, um, whether they be digital photography or um, visual design programs, often one of the things that you can put right on top of an image that you're working with uh, is some version of what we're looking at, which is a rule of thirds, but with a, with a diagonal component to put in there. And the initial, if you really look at it, and I really add all of this, usually if I'm trying to describe this to people. I'll just say, throw that rule of thirds that you had right over a drawing. And then for me, I tend to just say, then go corner to corner through those. And that helps once again, what it does is it gives you, it adds some additional interest points if you're balancing multiple, you know, a much more complicated. What they're doing is they're showing you then additionally, you can go from corner through bottom, corner through bottom, corner through top, and corner through top. And what this does is it then introduces even more hot spots that are possible when you're setting up a more complicated composition or you're trying to do a more um, detailed analysis of a sketch that you have. So that's probably a little more than you want to hear. But there's just all kinds of ways to study what you're doing. But here's just a sheet showing, and often, if we were in a drawing class, I'd probably have you do a bunch of just quick thumbnails. Thumbnails are loose, sort of four or five minute sketches where you're exploring a composition. And then you just sort of quickly apply that rule of thirds over it and sort of look, where's your hot spot? Where's that absolute um, spot within your composition where a lot of the interest uh, and action of your subject is occurring? And this is just a nice little quick example of that. And then what I did is I just grabbed, I mean, and these are just random. 
So I just grab some, I'm not using my own landscapes. I'm just using some I grabbed offline. And once again, and this is something you can do on your own. So I won't spend a lot of time, but if I, if I wanted to work with that basic idea and I just, and this is what's fun about digital. You can just pull these images up, reach up to the top, um, choose a tool and you can see, wow, look at this, bang, bang. So if you're looking at this, this artist really hit it. There is probably the primary subject. Now he's, or he or she has got a lot of things going on in the other parts of the painting. And we haven't talked about how your eye moves, but on top of the fact that you're, you've got that rule of thirds, your eye sort of moves right back through that composition through the light and shadow in that nice little S curve that takes you back into this. And then we could even use that diagonal shadow the artist used that bounces us and keeps us in the image. So all kinds of really um, beautiful attentiveness to controlling how the viewer experiences the piece. And another example, and I just grabbed a black and white. It's actually a black and white of a color piece, but very often you get the, you can really see the bones of what's happening in the composition when you remove the color, which is gonna be the topic that we're gonna talk about for hopefully the main focus of this. Once again, if you look at this and I grab my tool and I just sort of say, okay, that looks like that's about thirds and I'm not stressing this, I could measure it off, but you know what? This is getting that same basic idea across. This one's really complicated. So I'll throw those diagonals through there too. If we want, we could play with that going from top through bottom, going from top Oops, through bottom, going from bottom, ooh, wow, sorry. Going from these, you know, what you're not seeing that I'm seeing is that I'm messing up and I just, in my Zoom screen, I just lost, so hold on. Mi dispiace, which is, I'm sorry, in Italian, because what happened, there we go. You didn't see it, but I lost the screen because I moved off my active palette. But if we were looking at third, at that analysis I just did, this artist has all kinds of stuff happening and it's happening in multiple places. So this is one of those examples where there's so much going on that there's actually, there's, there's visual interest that is packed through this piece. Um, one of the places where this is a particularly nice example to talk about that idea of setting up a composition and thinking about things is when you think scale. So this artist has um, some overlap. I'll grab that. So he's got, or he or she has shapes that are overlapping, shapes that are cropped. So those move to the forward. If you think about those um, things we talked about as a repetition of shape that is repeating overlapping other shapes. And as it repeats, the shapes get smaller. So there's another visual clue. You have much smaller repetition of similar shapes. You're using linear perspective, in this case, very casual one point perspective that is also moving you back through the composition. So there's a lot of stuff, all of those cues of spatial illusion, as well as applying that rule of thirds to see action points or those intersections. This one has sort of everything working for you. And we're just gonna look at another example before we go to some painting. And I just grabbed this because it's a really nice, if anybody's taken a painting class, where you talk about positive and negative space, this is uh, likely um, from that kind of an exercise. But once again, I mean, when you look at this piece, and you split it up into those thirds, you could just see, once again, bam, if you look at those sort of intersecting points, this artist is giving you this repeated symmetrical shape, because if I even, if I add that center line, 
that thing that you usually try to avoid, which is stuff happening there. This artist is actually playing off that symmetrical balance between these two parts, which are both visually interesting and um, repeating shapes. And I will not add um, the principles of design as yet another variable to talk about because I may just have you turn the computer off if I get into all of that. But this piece has a whole lot going on again in terms of organizing a composition that is, is really carefully thought out. And I guess that's what we're trying to get towards is this notion that we wanna really organize and think about the compositions that we're working with. So now what I wanna do is go back to where we were gonna start. And the technique we're gonna talk about, well, we're talking about a, proceed, a process called Grise, and we're talking about a corresponding technique called glazing. So when you look at a stained glass window, you see the color more brilliantly because the light is coming from behind. It's, it's backlighted. The way we understand color is because of light in the environment. So the pigment we're using is trying to reproduce um, an illusion of the way we actually see light because we see light as uh, an experience of reflected uh, the spectrum of visible light. So paint and the way we visibly experience color are two different things. And glazing this te technique we're gonna add to um, an approach called grise is a way that you try to use transparent color to make that effect of a backlighted stained glass window um, happen on your canvas. So these are both stained glass window examples and there's a definition of glazing and um, you're going to get a link provided for this lecture so you could spend a little more, more time. Like I said, I'm really just moving through this. But in simplest terms, glazing is putting transparent layers of paint over something that is already a dry painted layer. And the reason that's important is we're going to develop an entire painting in achroma, meaning no color or monochromatic if we were just making it um, a mixed single color painting. And then we're going to put the color over top. So glazing um, sort of worked hand in hand with this other approach called um, grise. And I also learned that we're allowed to say it the way it would look to us, which is griselle. And that's, there's the uh, actual definition of this technique. And there's a little bit more information there um, from this guy named Jonathan Breyer, who has a pretty good website that talks about uh, composition and a lot of these subtle things that we're just sort of jumping through rather fast. But um, using grise or griselle is where we're going to build up, think of it as a black and white and gray full value composition as the foundation or the underpainting. So the steps that, that you want to think about, because so far everything I've talked about is about being analytical and sort of trying to control how a person, how a viewer experiences this composition that you're projecting, this piece that you're going to be projecting um, out into the world. So generally you want to do sketches and those sketches are where you're thinking about compositional concern and where you could use tools like the rule of thirds and think about um, pictorial space and balance. Once you've done some sketches and you like what you have, then you're going to actually move that onto canvas. You can use pencil, you can use charcoal, or you can use um, thinned paint and directly paint into the canvas. And then that's where this um, technique comes in called grise. It effectively imagine like think of a marble piece of sculpture where you see all of the light and shadow, but there's no color. You're developing an entire painting that way, and we're going to do that um, in a moment. And then color is the last step. So you've separated in that process. Drawing is the more analytical, where you're thinking about composition and balance, and you're making sure you're working those problems out in the drawing. Then the foundation layer or the underpainting layer that we're calling, in this case, we're using a technique known as um, grise or griselle, that's where you're working through the problems of light and shadow and how you're dealing with 
um, the value gradations and contrast through the whole piece. And then color becomes a separate, um, that the sort of last part of this three steps that you're working through um, for your painting. So it particularly helps because you're separating instead of trying to juggle and ride the bike simultaneously. And it particularly, I think is helpful um, early on in painting. And I find it helpful now with, you know, 40 plus years behind me of painting because it refocuses and makes me think through all the problems that are present in each of those steps. So that's where we're heading. And there's more information there. And I gave you this guy's website because he has all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, let's see. This is an example of detail of a Rembrandt. Um, there was white under this. So he did a, a white and black layer and then applied the color. And you can tell the white is almost like a spotlight shining behind the transparent color to give you that gloss. Um, one of my very favorite paintings by Giovanni Bellini. And you can see that glow. Once again, there are layers on top of um, whites and pale values so that when the color goes over top, the, the value under it is almost shining like a light through. Um, another example, and this is a Titian piece, and you can see that glow coming through the soft veils of color over the white. Here's an example of a Vermeer, and then somebody who tried to recreate um, that piece. So you could see what would be literally the white painted under it. So now we're going to work through these sketches. There we go. You're going to work some sketches. You've got paint if you're working with acrylic and you want to work in a glazing technique. I always recommend, I mean, I love golden paint. That's one of the brands, but there's a lot of brands that work. So glazing liquid is one thing. It causes the paint to be viscous, it dries much slower and it adds transparency. So often I'll put that on my can, on my palette before I put the paint down. And then separately you have the gloss medium. Gloss medium is simply the basis of acrylic paint, the polymer itself without pigment in it. It dries very fast, so it does not allow blending um, very easily. So that's why the glazing liquid is what I put on the palette. It helps the paint to stay um, malleable or viscous that I can blend for a longer period of time. And um, depending on what you'd want to buy, you could buy a whole, so there's a palette set up down on the lower right that looks more like I would start working with with a very full range of color. Then there's a palette on the left there with your basic color, your white, primary yellow, primary red primary blue, which is actually lemon yellow, magenta, and cyan. Um, and then on the bottom, uh, I always put a little bit of blue and a little bit of um, burn umber and mix them together for what I call a mixed black, because too black is far too dense. Um, and it, it, it just destroys color when you're trying to um, mix shades. So I always use a mixed black. And we're going to look at this in a moment when I move over to. So you're going to work on a substrate on some kind of either board or canvas. You put a coat of color over that canvas to get rid of the white. Um, again, it, and I'm working in really traditional method and that's called a ground. This is a very soft sort of um, yellow ochre kind of ground, very transparent, a lot of acrylic gel medium from uh, acrylic uh, gloss medium and varnish mixed with it so that you're just putting a transparent coat over. When I'm working, I actually work in a fairly saturated orange ground. A ground is something that you sort of figure out, but this is the most traditional. Um, and then there's some information there that will help you. And like I said, I'm going to share this link. So you would have, you have time to look at this information a little bit more if you want to go back in a little less uh, quick review. So there's your canvas that has, um, and this is a canvas board. Uh, I'm actually working for this demonstration. I'm working on a piece of um, mounted hardwood. Hardwood, canvas, canvas board, they all are just substrates, are foundations on which you're going to build a painting. And the very painting we're going to work with today, this is the start of it. And I'm working in that technique of grisé. So I have a very pale, in fact, it almost shows up as white here, 
but it is a very pale um, ground that's down that has that is a soft, 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 warm white. So a little yellow in there, a little ochre. And I did my sketches as preliminaries, but when I went to the canvas, I went right to paint. That's a choice you can make. It could be soft pencil. It could be charcoal. I'm using paint. So you could see I set that sketch in. And this is, this is an example of mixed black. So I'm using umber, a little bit of ink. Um, and by the way, ink is what I use with acrylic paint. Uh, it is transparent, it's organic, and it doesn't overwhelm. So it, instead of black paint, which I never use, uh, I keep a jar of ink open, or I mix a black by using burn umber. And um, if I had my choice, I use burn umber and Prussian blue. If I'm working with your basic set, I'd use primary blue and burnt umber and get a dark value like this. So there is the second, as I'm working through this painting, in this uh, grise technique. So I'm developing the whole painting, but I'm just doing it uh, monochromatically. In this case, it's my mixed black and white. Um, and I'm working through trying to figure out within that composition where the range of values are gonna be. And there's with a little bit more finish. So you can now see there's that landscape and it's pretty much in place, but there's no color. And this is the very landscape we're gonna pause for a moment. Well, it won't seem like a much of a moment for you, but we're gonna pause while I move the, um, set this computer up at my workstation. And then we're gonna work through this painting a little bit. So I will see you in a moment. Okay, so we're back now. There's that painting that we were looking at. So as I said, I had done some sketches. I had a bunch of photos, but my primary reference photo is here for some color. And I always um, remind myself and students when I'm working is that photos are not, you're not trying to reproduce a photo. You're trying to reproduce the experience that you had when you were out in that environment. So being in that environment and paying attention, I think it was a, Henry David Throw that said, um, looking is not important. What really matters is seeing. So when you're out there, you wanna really try to see and experience what that is, the, the multi -sen sensation of being out in that place and then take a lot of photos. So the photo becomes a visual reference when you're back in the studio. It doesn't be, you're not a slave to the photo. Okay, so I've got this piece, I've worked through a lot of the value now. Um, and I have, I have a full palette set up. Because I'm now going to move to work with color. And I was just doing a class yesterday. So I have a small palette set up too from that class. So I'm going to keep both of those here. And in fact, so I have both the palettes. I have a variety of brushes. I mean, I have a, off your view, probably another six or 800 brushes just piled in containers, but I grabbed a pretty big assortment. So at this point, I wanna start thinking about how can I work um, with this idea of glazing, a transparent um, layer of color that can be applied in multiple layers. So I'm grabbing my glazing liquid because I'm looking and my palette is so messy that I've already used up. So I'm putting a little bit of that glazing liquid down on my mixing palette. And I'm also grabbing, I have a small container for when I go outside, but I'm using the gloss medium. I just have it in a little container. I'm gonna put a little bit of that down too. They both will um, thin the paint and allow it to be a transparent are semi-transparent because with acrylic, I don't want to use just water. Water will um, thin it, but it, all the bond of the paint is gone. Since polymer is the bonding agent, I don't want to use water because water is not the bonding agent. So it's water soluble, but it is not water-based. Okay, so let's look at this. And I know that there's going to be a lot of greens. So I'm grabbing um, a color I really like. It is uh, green gold and 
golden color makes it, so does, uh, I know that Windsor Newton has it and I think it might even be on Liquitex now. So green gold is the color that I just grabbed. It's a beautiful, it is already a transparent color and I never believe in color out of the tube. And I'm looking at the greens that I see in that brilliant summer scene. So I just added some primary yellow into it. And I'm liking that. And I'm gonna put a tiny, just, I mean, the smallest dab of white. Cause the moment you add white or black, you're um, dimming the saturation. Color has three parts. It has the saturation or the um, intensity. It has the color itself, the hue, whether it's green, blue, red, and then it has the light and dark, the value. So the intensity, if I add um, white or black or both, I dim the intensity, I turn the volume of the color down. I don't want this volume to be turned down because it's a brilliant green. So now I just made that nice light Really, and I, you notice I moved off to the side when I made it lighter. That way I still have the color I mixed and now I have a lighter color. I added a little bit of, um, in this case, I actually went right to the gloss medium only because I know it doesn't, I'm not gonna blend this for any length of time. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna go right through some of those areas because I see just this incredibly brilliant green that comes all through. So I'm gonna just start working some of that in. Notice when I go over the darker areas, I don't really see that very much. Over the lighter areas, it instantly starts to pop. So I'm gonna work that brilliant green that I just mixed. And I'm gonna sort of pull it right through some of those areas where I know I'm gonna have all of that green. So instantly you can see how this notion of glazing begins to very quickly transform that achromatic or monochromatic um, composition where I'm now applying the color in layers. So I'm going to show you, and by the way, when you're working with acrylic, and you likely know this, don't ever just set your brush there because in 10 minutes of sitting on the table, it will start to harden. So I always keep it in um, water. So I'm gonna show you that when I'm glazing, not all my color is gonna be transparent. So these darks with that transparent, um, very, very transparent, brilliant green gold glaze I just put in, those darks just read as a sort of gray color. And I don't, I don't want the greens to dull just because they're in shadows. So at times, and I'm gonna grab um, a phthalo blue, which already is leaning green. So I'm mixing again, I'm mixing color and I just put some, I guess I'm off your camera. Yeah, we'll tilt this down just a hair, there we go. So I'm making a nice dark green. I'm gonna take a tiny bit of that green gold into it. And I'm gonna go for just a little bit of that primary blue because I want this to have some verbs, to have a little energy, a little tiny bit of primary Yellow, so I'm mixing. I'm not just grabbing tubes of color. And I want this to have a little bit of viscosity, so I'm grabbing some of that glazing liquid, but I'm not thinning it dramatically. And now in these shadows, since I know those shadows are still grasses, I'm building a much more opaque layer. And what I might as well do is, since I know they're grasses, as I'm beginning to build up the color, I'm using brush strokes that also reflect the movement and the gesture of the subject. In this case, swaying grasses that tend to be leaning and um, as they go from bottom towards top, they're leaning towards the left. So now that color that I'm beginning to work in there is much, much more believable than where that transparent dark value of my grise underpainting was showing through that initial transparency. So you're not always using transparent color. So nor am I finishing this painting in one go. So now I would work through and I'm not going to do that because we'd be here for a lot longer than this class. So I'm not going to end up with this painting finished. 
but I'd work that all through. I see that there's, there's a variety of darker greens up there. So I just put a little bit more glazing liquid on my brush so that it's more fluid. And I'm just gonna come in here right on top of some of these values. And I'm gonna just start to, and I'm just sort of scuffing and scumbling with my brush. So I'm beginning to establish where there's gonna be a variety of those greens. So once again, I'm working with this notion of glazing. And I'm not getting all worried and going, oh my gosh, I just went over the trunk of that tree because acrylic is a self-covering medium and you're doing the painting in layers. So I can always go back and work with that. So now I would keep, you can see how this is starting to emerge how this painting is gradually getting to get color. One of the things I wanna do, and I should have done this first, so bad me. I know that I've got sky back there and it's a very brilliant day. And I was out in mid, mid, not mid, but late morning. So it was really already getting extremely bright. So I have white down, which means I don't need necessarily, I could mix an opaque blue for the sky, but instead, since I've wiped down, I'm gonna make a very, very transparent, um, and it's a coolish blue. So I'm just touching some ultramarine in there. So I used um, some manganese on a tiny bit of ultramarine, and I'm just gonna pull that through where I know the sky is. And I may have to hold this right up to the computer the camera for that to show, because I'm using a really, really subtle, uh, and I don't, well, it's sort of showing up. Might be easier just to look at the color on the brush and see how bright it is. It's much, much brighter blue on the brush, but because it's transparent. So let's say I said, oh, I want that to be darker. So now I'm grabbing a little bit more of each of those colors, the manganese and the, um, Sorry, the manganese and the ultramarine. So I had a now it's a little bit less thin. So maybe when I put that in, you're seeing it more. And I, it was an exceedingly pale, but that doesn't mean I have. So now I've got that sky suggested, and I really used that what was virtually a pure white that I went in for the sky. Um, and I did that all with a transparent glaze. And I would keep working on this. So the only thing I'll do yet, rather than finish the whole painting while we're here, is I'm gonna just mix. So I have, I have that one green down. It was my middle green that I mixed. And I know that in the shadows here, the green starts moving blue, um, which also is one of those things that occurs as things move farther away from you not only will the color dull a little bit, but um, Leonardo called it the bluing of distance. It will also tend to slightly gray down or dim, and it'll move a little bit more blue. So now I sort of blued that green just a little bit, and I'm gonna just work some of that in. That's not the ideal brush, so why am I using it? I always laugh because I tell students, don't just try to do a painting with one brush, but sometimes when you're working, you just forget. So there, I grabbed a much better shape. I went for a nice larger round so I could work that, what is a distinctly um, more blue green. And if I want to push it, I'm going to grab some teal. And I took a nice brush load of that glazing liquid. So if I went up on the edges where it starts to lighten, if I really want to exaggerate so that you are aware of that coolness. So I'm just bringing that very pale and cool blue glaze as a foundation that I'm working. And I see that this is the most, one of the most brilliant overhanging lights of the tree that's there in the distance. So I'm just gonna get that foundation in place. 
for that blue green. And if I want it, I'm going to grab a little bit more of that ultramarine, which is very, very um, violet blue. I'm going to grab a tiny bit of, uh, this is cad light, so it's even paler. I'm going to take another brush load of that teal because when I look I see some there we go I see some really distinct coolness to those greens that are in the back and because these are still not fully opaque I'm getting a sense of some of that light that is or some of the dark I'm sorry that's showing through as I'm developing You'll notice this big area here. That's going to be the brilliant green of that one tree coming down. So I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to take, here's that original light green. And because I had glazing liquid in it, it has not dried. So I'm going to, I just blued it a little bit because I used what was already in my brush. And then I'm going to grab some of that CAD yellow light. Because when I look, I'm finding that original glaze I did to be too yellow. So if I wanted, I could, I can actually change that glaze with just another glaze. So now that's getting, that is a little less yellow, just yellow and a little bit more green to the glaze itself. And that also is gonna help me. So this brilliant, light, this backlighted green that is behind, that's showing up sort of behind a lot of these trees. As soon as I put that in, now you're beginning to see how, how that first round of color would come together. That wouldn't be a finished painting. Um, but it, this is how I would work. And as I work through this first round of color on the whole piece, then I'll come in with another round and the color is going to be less transparent because I'm going to begin looking now at where I want values to lay over top of other values. So I might want them less transparent. And I'm going to slowly build from this brilliant glowing color where I, where I saw the brightest, most brilliant, and I'm gonna sort of build towards the more opaque colors that are tend to be in the foreground, that tend to describe texture and specific kinds of edges. Um, and that's what I would do. So before I close this up and head back, um, because this looks so like barren right now, so I'm gonna just get a tiny, so I took, a, I took some Prussian blue and we're off your screen. So well, there we go, Prussian blue, which is a really, really dark black blue. And I'm gonna grab, and I'm moving off because I took too much of it. So it's, it's still in my brush. There's Prussian blue and burn umber. That's giving me a, and I'm gonna take a big brush load of the glazing liquid. And I look and that's still too green. I don't like how green it is. So I'm just gonna save time and grab some I just grabbed a brush load of cat orange. I'm looking at what I see up here and there's edges that are dirt. So it might not even be obvious. But what happens is there's, there's dirt on the edges of a gravel path. So I'm just gonna work some of that in. And notice how I didn't, I didn't stress that. I'm not like, oh my gosh, are you sure? Did I convey that that absolutely is no dirt over there. I'm just doing this in layers. So now I've got a little bit of warmth there. And now I'm gonna take the brush back into that blue. Um, I'm gonna take a whole brush load of the glazing liquid. I'm just gonna pull that through even these, because these very brilliant light highlights, it's still gonna be gravel. So just for my own sake, I'm finding that white to be distracting right now as I'm working color in. 
So I'm just gonna get a little bit of that suggestion of the color in. And again, I would be doing this a lot more. So I'm gonna grab a little bit of light ultramarine. I went right back into what I had. This is where I would dip. There's my container of ink. So I'm just gonna dip into that ink. And wow, that already, even the ink, it went really strong, really fast. So I'm just gonna go through some of those shadows that I already put in there. And the ones in the back get even more blue. That idea again, that bluing of distance. So that by just getting that little bit of value begun, you can see now with both the organics, all the greens and that path, how that first layer of um, glazed color would work as you're building this composition. So I'm gonna pause again. Okay, so I'm back. I think we're running very close to out of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just click through. I mean, I'm not even gonna talk. I'm just gonna click through. And, you know, I'm Italian American. So the fact I'm not gonna talk is almost amazing in itself. So I'll sit on my hands and we're just gonna click through a couple images and then there'll be time for questions. So I'm gonna start sharing again. So there's that image that we just saw and we went through that process. So I'm gonna click through some other paintings as they worked towards completion. This is my studio cat, so I figured I'd end with, with her. So this will end, and I'm going to come on uh, at the end of your meeting. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. So I hope you got some good information out of that. Um, and as I said, I will share this as a YouTube link as well. And that way you can watch it if you want to review some of the topics. So thanks so much. I enjoyed being here.